we didn't know anything about what had been learned through the 60s and 70s about uh, meteorite impact and the, the, the impact rates the, because we had grown up with our textbooks which said that there indeed were bombarding asteroids and comets but this was all in the early days the so-called early bombardment of the earth and it was all over and sure meteor crater was probably a an impact crater but that's only one it couldn't affect geologic history in 1980 Louis Alvarez, together with his son and colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, came up with a very controversial theory. A thin layer of clay found at Gubbio in northern Italy marks the boundary between Cretaceous and Tertiary limestones, the so-called KT boundary layer. To explain why it contains 30 times more of the very rare element iridium than the layers above and below it, Alvarez argued that the Earth must have been hit by an extraterrestrial object containing that iridium. Quite different evidence of a strange event at the KT boundary came from scientists drilling the ocean bed to extract the cause. The discovery is recalled by one of those scientists, Ken Su. In 1980, I had been working with ocean sediments for more than 10 years. And during those years, we had developed techniques to make very precise determination of the age of the sediments. And we also developed a very new technique of getting the isotope composition of sediments from very, very small samples. And those two developments permitted myself to notice there was a major isotope anomaly at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. And this perturbation suggested to us it was a very major environmental catastrophe which took place. That was the reason I got into this KT debate. As an isotope geochemist, I became attracted to this debate by what Ken Su had noticed he found that the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 in the skeletons of tiny marine plankton fossils showed an abrupt change right at the KT boundary. Under normal conditions of photosynthesis, the living organic part of these plankton find it easier to use carbon-12 rather than carbon-13. As a result, more carbon-13 finds its way into the skeletons. But at the KT boundary, there is a major disruption of the oceanic carbon cycle. More than 95% of all marine surface water plankton with carbonate skeletons became extinct. It was a global event, whether it's tropical or high in altitude, polar waters. And we call this ocean the strange enough ocean in order to emphasize the ocean was almost devoid of living organisms. With most of the plankton gone, there's absolutely nothing left to remove any of the carbon-12 from the surface waters of the ocean. Any surviving plankton that try to grow new carbonate skeletons under these strange love conditions will contain more carbon-12 than normal. When we look at the carbon isotope record and the rocks that span the KT boundary, in this case at a site from Woodside Creek in New Zealand, we can see that the background Cretaceous values remain fairly constant. However, right at the KT boundary, they become dramatically more negative, what Ken Su has called the carbon isotope anomaly. Above the boundary, they gradually return to more normal values. The period of time when the ocean was in this strange love state and almost devoid of surface organisms may only have lasted a few hundred or thousand years, but the recovery process took much longer. Alvarez and Sue were not alone in realizing that something truly catastrophic may have occurred at the end of the Cretaceous. It was actually a coincidence, and uh, in the April of 1980, there were four papers published in three different journals, and all of them suggest suggesting either an asteroid or a comet hit the Earth 65 million years ago and caused a mass extinction, such as the extinction of dinosaurs and of marine plankton. Such a controversial idea has led to more than a decade of intense research and at times heated debate amongst scientists. 
big questions had to be answered. Where did the asteroid hit? What effects did it have? Did it, as Alvarez suggested, cause a mass extinction that wiped out 80% of all species that were then living on the Earth? Finding the big buried crater in Yucatan was a major step because we found the smoking gun. Really, we found the smoking cannon that produced the catastrophe at the end of the Cretaceous. We join a team of latter-day crater hunters at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, Houston, Texas. Team leader, Buck Sharpton, recalls how the crater was discovered. The surface expression is not at all what you would expect of a giant impact feature. It's completely covered by a veneer of uh, Cenozoic rocks that have been laid down on top of it. Fortunately, the impact occurred right on the coast of what is, what is the present coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. It's centered just about on the town of Progreso, located right here. Since the crater was formed 65 million years ago, it's been buried under more than a kilometer of sediments. Finding it wasn't easy. We have to rely on geophysical techniques of exploration, and the structure has actually been known of since 1950. Petroleum companies prospecting for oil discovered a large circular anomaly in the gravity data they acquired as an aid to exploration. It was centered on Progresso. This would be about where Progresso is, right here. So the coastline of the Yucatan Peninsula would run the northern coast along this line here, through the center of the crater, and then you're running right along the west coast, along the western edge of the map zone. And the thing that stands out, of course, is this deep depression, signifying a region where the gravity values are lower than normal. Drilling into rocks where the impact crater should be produced geological cores of a rock type that was immediately recognizable to the scientists. This is very similar to the type of impact rock found at the Reese Impact Crater in Germany. It has abundant shock deformation evidence in it, including bits of melted and deformed rocks, and is a key sample for proving that Chicxulub is in fact an impact crater. And this sample, collected from about 200 meters below the impact rock, is completely melted. It can be dated radiometrically, and it shows that the age of the crater is indistinguishable from the KT boundary. Nearly 2,000 kilometers to the east of the impact site, lies the island of Haiti, where a different kind of evidence for the impact was found. At the Katy boundary in Haiti, we've discovered in, first in 1991, glass spherules at the boundary, which are impact glasses. So they're of the order of about eight millimeters in diameter. And they have a chemistry identical to that of glasses that are found in the Chicxulub crater. These spherules have been dated by argon-argon methods to about 64.5 million years. And again, they are exactly the same age as the Chicxulub glasses. So not only is their chemistry identical, but also their, their argon-argon age. So finding glass spherules is a good way of tying a deposit to the impact. <laughs> 